Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Number of things that I want to talk about today on a beautiful Thursday, sunny, really nice weather out. Pretty crisp weather. Uh, Omar will be, I sent you a whole bunch on email and, and WhatsApp, a couple of videos and images that, um, inshallah, that'll be for the later segment of our program today. <coughs> <coughs> but I want to first discuss something a lot of people are saying or talking about mentally being strained spiritually they're strained they're seeing so much bad news they're seeing so much conflict but I'm going to show you guys so uh, in a little bit a video of a man who lost both of his sons and apparently he was washing there at like a ghusl area for other Dead people, he gives us, you know, people killed in the war, I should say, casualties of the war. <clears throat> there it is, Omar. And the iman he's showing is so important for us to look at because if the people on the ground are displaying that kind of iman, then the people who are two and 3,000 miles away living in peace and comfort uh, should take an example from that. Uh, it may not be easy for us to have patience because generally Westerners tend to be living in a nama. Okay, we're living a lot of blessings and a lot of uh, uh, good things are hap happen to us in our lives. For people who are battered regularly, it's not so not the case. Okay, if they're battered on a regular basis, you get good at being patient. Sabr is something that develops over time. So the, the ibadah that Allah expects from people is that if you're in a state of tribulation and Allah selected you to receive the brunt of tribulations and bala and all sorts of problems, your ibadah is to be an exemplar of patience. If you're a privileged person like us, we're privileged. Our health is fine. If you get scratched, that's news, right? Forget getting killed and getting your family killed, okay? If you're one of, if you're in that category of, of life, your ibadah is khidmah. Your ibadah is to use your energy, your wealth, your resources, and your blessings to do a lot of service for the ummah, okay? And for people at large, let's say, depending on what industry you're in. That's how we have to view things. So either your person's ibadah is sabr, patience, or their ibadah is khidmah and of course <coughs> people are always in different states and conditions not going to be it's not always 100% uh, uh, one way or the or another but we can pretty confidently say that in general western people are privileged we we, we live in society alhamdulillah we live in societies that have a lot more safety Things that would, are happening right now to the people in Gaza, it's sort of unthinkable for it to happen to somebody living in New York, New Jersey, you know, California, Texas, London. It's unthinkable. So the ibadah expected from them is not going to be the ibadah expected from us and vice versa. So it's not um, always, it's, they're an example. They're, they're showing us that no matter what happens, angels will come and support you. And Allah will help you do the right thing. Because they're flesh and blood just like us. So if, if they're able to, to withstand that burden of your family being killed, then next time something far less than that happens to us, we have to take an example from that patience. Okay, N uh, Northern Jersey is, is filled with Palestinians who are telling us stories uh, about you know, their families calling them, you know, a couple of days ago and just saying goodbye from Gaza, knowing that anything could happen. And the imam, there was a public aza, aza is a condolences. When a person dies that night, usually, or the next day you do a aza, uh, which is a, everyone comes in and gives condolences to this family. It gives them some emotional support. Well, the imam of that mosque, Imam al-Qatanani, was watching TV and saw his relatives on the news and called them immediately, 
15 members of the family were killed in a bombing. 15 members of the family. In one event, people ask, how is it that people can bear this, this calamity? You can bear it because Allah supports you. And he sends malaika to support you. So that's the, the that's what we have to have in mind is that even if this stuff were to happen to you, you'll be supported. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send someone, malaika to support you. And that's what we believe in. That's what happens. Yeah, that's what we believe in. And that's what we know happens, that Allah ta'ala sends malaika to serve us. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَةِ الدُّنْيَا We are your protectors. Okay? In this life, Allah says in the Quran. So we're never alone. People are never alone. But your, your heart has to be in the position to be able to receive. So electricity always works as long as the outlet is clean and the, and the outlet is connected to the rest of the uh, uh, power in the house. Then I can plug something in and it's going to work. Okay. Notice that the malaika are hardly talked about in the world. But in this day and age, or this period of time, we suddenly have an influx of exorcism movies and jinn movies. We have a, a society that's more, far more interested in the jinn than in angels. Uh, we can't separate the issue of angels from the is issue of tribulations. Because as Allah says, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَةِ الدُّنْيَا We are your protectors. In the desert, the Prophet wasallam said, if you're ever in the desert, okay, <coughs> excuse me, if you're ever in the desert and you are lost, the Prophet wasallam said, call out, يَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ أَعِينُونِي O servants of Allah, help me. Why? To give you a feeling that you're not alone. It's one of the great blessings that Allah gives people is a feeling that they're not alone. That, Yes, you're sent down here on the earth to be tested, but you're not out there alone. And the Prophet ﷺ said, because they're out in the desert and they have jobs. Malaika that have jobs. I asked myself, what kind of job is there to do in the desert? Allah knows best, they're doing something. Okay? So, imagine now outside the desert. You can be in a city, but it feels as lonely as a desert. So our belief is that we are surrounded by malaika constantly and nonstop. We have to keep this in mind. They are protecting us by, by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his permission. They're praying for us. Okay. We have this all in the Quran. So, but society, when it's sick, it tends to focus a lot on demons. However, demons in a sense are a proof of the truth because if, if a demonic force from the unseen exists, then it's not so far off, all right, that an angelic force exists, right? You should be able to believe the opposite side now. If you believe in a demonic force, you got to also believe in an angelic force. I see okay. a friend, uh, SubhanAllah, like he wasn't really religious, yeah. but he's into the conspiracies and stuff. And he came to the c conclusion that, you know, like, man, there's so much satanic stuff going on in, yep. this, in this industry. That if Satan exists, then God has to exist. Yeah. That's what made him believe in God, actually, which is, subhanAllah, it's actually very interesting. It's amazing that people who go down the dark side, that dark path, be, that the path is tied to the hip with the path of light. You can't possibly believe in a path of darkness without a path of light. But the constant repetition of uh, uh, this obsession with shayateen and jinn and demons, we have to just... I, I mean, I like to, 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 to watch these things. I'm interested in it. But simultaneously, you have to focus a lot about bringing down malaika. And this is one of the things we know how to do very well in Islam. Every majlis of remembrance is surrounded by malaika. They come down and they attend. You don't have to be perfect. Just the fact that you're doing this majlis of remembrance, malaika will attend with you. And this ability to bring down malaika is one of the most important um, you know, features that we have in our religion. We know how to bring down malaika. We could sit down now, okay, prepare ourselves, dress nicely, clean the area, bring some bukhur, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we bring down a lot of malaika. And they completely wash away. They're surrounding you. Some, some say going through you. 
all sorts of uh, connections with them. That's why you come off those mis- oh, those gatherings. You feel like you're floating on air because you're surrounded constantly by Madaika. And kids who grow up in that, when they leave that, they realize something's off and they come back to it. They don't need an argument, right? A theoretical argument on the existence of good and evil and Islam and kufr, okay? <clears throat> Even, uh, who was it? Who was it? Sheikh Hashim. Sheikh Hashim said that he decided he's going to go to the ultimate uh, truth, which is the Ethiopian Christians. In his mind, he calculated that the, the real truth is found with the Ethiopian Christians. Well, the only way he could get there with his funds is to travel to Morocco, then take buses and trains all the way from Morocco to Ethiopia. <coughs> The whole time, it took a long time, okay? It took a long time for him to do this. In during that period of time, he interacted with Muslims so much that when he arrived at the Christian monastery, okay, after, see, after living with Muslims for like four or five months, from Morocco all the way down to Ethiopia, because he didn't travel automatically, he took different pit stops. I mean, he didn't travel the whole time. He took different pit stops. Okay, there he, when he arrived, he's like, these people are in darkness, although they're the monks, whereas the Muslims that he were with, they were praying, they were happy, there was like life, they were charitable. So he's like, no, 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 that's not true. It was not an intellectual conclusion. It was a reality-based conclusion. The reality was that these Muslims... They have more light, or he didn't, probably doesn't know what light and darkness. He just, they have life into them. They have belief. They have trust. Omar, are we ready to show the video of that, brother? Okay, while Omar pulls that up, let me uh, answer the question. Sister, she said, what is the value of the incense burning? It said that Malaika like it, and as a result of that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to uh, burn incense in the mosque every day. And any majlis that they were on gathering, also the Prophet وسلم, would burn incense. So we get it as a sunnah from the Prophet. Yeah. Uh, um, Maryam says, Madik used to burn incense before his class. That's true. Omar ibn Khattab used to do it before Tarawih. Okay. Are you drinking a Kickstarter? I don't even know what this is, to be quite honest with you. Um, I don't even know if it's good for me to be drinking this, but I needed to give myself a little jolt. So this is some kind of big double shot energy ginseng grano energy coffee beverage. It's probably really bad for you, but I just needed to wake myself up real quick. Have you ever had that feeling for some reason? You just need a shot real quick. Listen to the iman that's going to come out of this man. A 22-year-old son and a three and a half year old son, same day, killed. And that's the reaction of a mu'min. Okay. Learn a lesson. Watch this. Share it with everybody. 
Show your children. That's our, this is what our deen brings us. That iman rasikh. Not going anywhere, that iman. He's yelling at the guy for having a desperate look on his face and having a desperate, you know, situation in his heart. Why, de- why desperate? When they are martyrs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they take you by the hand to Jannah. That's the fruit of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? That is the fruit. In contrast, some people, they don't have this iman. What they end up with is bottling up a ton of anger. Then when the situation happens and they're nonstop talking about their oppressor. If you're on Instagram, come onto YouTube so you can see the whole screen. (coughs) There are people out there, all they do is talk about the bad thing that happened to them. And hating on the people who did it. Well, when the tables turn, you focus so much on your oppressor without realizing you become him. This is what we're seeing in Philistine. We said in earlier streams that in the beginning, there's no doubt, Jews were completely victims of all sorts of hate and anti-Semitism. Okay? Well, they end up spending so much time doing dhikr of, uh, uh, of the Holocaust and dhikr, constant nonstop remembrance and talking about it. Hey, it looks like you've become them. You have become the aggressor. You are now the oppressor. You are now what you did dhikr of, repeatedly talking about the oppression, the oppression, the killing, the killing. Fast forward 100 years, you're doing it. And a Muslim, when he is abused by someone and oppressed, we don't even look at that person. That person is just a tool. That person is a tool. This is the aqidah that we have to have that cleans out our hearts. And that's this is the lead into our guest for today. He's going to give us a few minutes of his time on the issue of strengthening our hearts in a time when people are in a constant state of either observing warfare or talking about it, and it could have an impact on our hearts. We need to strengthen it. Okay. Our guest, Sheikh Yahya. Can you hear me, Sheikh? Mumtaz. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think you might not be able to see me, but we can all hear you. Alhamdulillah. I don't know if you saw the video that I shared, but in, in a sense, it was, or in a, a quick summary of it, a man had lost two of his children. And then the man is basically in a ghusl room in a hospital, it appears to be where they wash the bodies. And he's telling his relative who's crying, and he's saying, stop this, right? In other words, decrease it, cool it a little bit, be happy that your relative died shaheed. This is the level of iman we're talking about. And uh, I said earlier that, we may not be accustomed to that level of sabr because we don't get a lot of tribulations. So the ibadah Allah expects from us is khidmah. And for those who suffer a lot, the ibadah expected from them is sabr. And for our audience, we don't need, need to introduce Sheikh Yahya. He's well known. He's from Pennsylvania, uh, lives now in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where they have al maqasid and they have a seminary, and Sheikh Yahya is going to, inshallah, give us a few minutes of his time on the heart. Inshallah. Bismillah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam wa kafa biha min ni'mah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of Islam. Insufficient indeed it is as a blessing and part of the blessing of islam is realizing is that no matter what it is that we do in this world no matter how hard we work in this world no matter what it is that we face in this world no matter what it is that we suffer in this world is that ultimately part of the meaning of being a muslim who submits to the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting that ultimately we are people of the hereafter 
and arguably the greatest sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu after the sunnah of mercy and rahmah is the sunnah of living for the hereafter and knowing that in every blink of the eye or in every bite that one takes that might be their last breath and nothing was inculcated in the hearts of the companions more than this a desire for the hereafter and to meet Allah Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet them. In fact, it's only to the degree that we prefer the hereafter over this world and desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will truly be effective here in this world. The less love of the world that we have in our hearts, the more that in love that we have in for the hereafter, the more effective that we will be. Part of the reason that the Prophet said, we don't need that anyone to tell us that the Prophet was the most influential person in history. He was the best of all of creation. And all of the Prophets, Adam, all the way up until the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, all between will be under his banner, Yom Al-Qiyam. We know that certainly, with certitude, is that part of the reason is that he was so, the main reason after the tawfiq of Allah that he was so effective is that he was a person whose heart was oriented towards the hereafter and oriented towards his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's only to the extent that we are oriented towards the hereafter will we truly be effective here in this world. And if there is some type of benefit that comes from us, if we're not oriented or that we are kind of oriented, it's not going to be usually true benefit. Although, in Allah, Allah does help this religion with profligates, with people who are not true believers and he could even help the case he could even help the religion with people who's not even a muslim but this is the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alaihi and if you look at his description sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he described the muslims in the end of time being like the foam on the flash from the flash flood like scum what did he say after the Sahaba were surprised at this because they saw how much strength that they had. Will we be few on that day, O Messenger of Allah? He said, no, you will be many. And then they, the Prophet said, but weakness will be cast into your heart. And what was the source of this weakness? What did our Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is that he said, dunya wa karahiyat Love of this world and a dislike of the hereafter, dislike of death, not wanting to die, wanting to remain here in this world. And we know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially tributes that to in his book subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims by nature, Muslims by definition are people of the hereafter. But this is where, and I'm not making any claims, we have all fallen so short, is that we've preferred the things of this world over preparation, for the hereafter and nothing is more important and there are so many different things that come to the extent that we make our hereafter the sole concern will be to the extent that Allah takes care of all of our concerns here in this world and let me be clear I am not in any way taking from the importance of action when I speak about this absolutely not that's ridiculous I'm only speaking from in a way to encourage us to really orient ourselves for the hereafter. While we're here in this world, no one was more active than the Prophet ﷺ. No one was more active than the companions. And how were they described? Their days was that they were like luyuth, lions, or they were like fursan, knights. But how were they at night? They were like ruhban. And we know our Prophet said, La Rahbani and Tafit Islam, there's no monasticism in Islam. We've been that have that replaced with Hajj in Jihad. However, is that at night they were people of worship, they were people of devotion, they were people who turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by day they were the most active of people doing everything that they could possibly do, serve the deen of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These meanings are the only meanings that we have to enrich in our hearts and to comfort us, especially in times like this. And I want to share with you a few verses from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no speech better than the speech of Allah. And nothing is more inspiring than the words of Allah. Nothing touches the hearts more than the words of the heavens and of the Lord of the heavens and the earth subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is starting with verse number 173 in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al nasaqa jama'u lukum fakhshohum. Those who were warned, your enemies have mobilized their forces against you. So fear them. Fakhshohum, so fear them. But what is the state of the heart of a believer? No matter what happens, no matter what odds are against them, no matter what it is that they're facing, any type of difficulty or tribulation across the board, is that people will tell them this, that, this, all of these different things that start to chip away at them and start to make them, that start to worry and start to fear and start all of these different things. But this is where Iman comes in. These people, فَزَادُهُمْ imanin. The warning only made them grow stronger in faith. وَقَالُوا And what was their shi'ar? What was it that they said? حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Our Lord is sufficient for us. Allah is alone is sufficient as an aid for us. And He is the best protector. Is that we have something that no one else has. We have Allah. We have our Lord on our side, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we need to be at the very depth of our being. The meanings of Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. And there are certain times where that, yes, we're not against taking the means outwardly in terms of that helping our spiritual state. But the greatest thing that I or anyone else can possibly do is to encourage my own sinful self and my fellow brothers and sisters to turn to Allah and to find comfort in these meanings. And when we do this, despite this our condition here that we have in the, this is related to an army about to attack that a group of people. But they only strengthened any man because they realize is that Allah is with them. Is that Allah is the one that will suffice them when to work on Allah life who hasbuh, whoever places their trust in Allah, He is sufficient for them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then if you and I can have this be our reality, look at the result. So they returned with Allah's favor and grace. That suffering no harm. What did one Allah? For they sought to please Allah. This is all we need. The Quran has everything we need. The murid, the one seeking, is not called the murid, the seeker, until he finds in the Quran everything you read, everything he mm. seeks. A seeker is not a seeker until he finds everything that he seeks in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is there for every single state, psychological condition, or any that possible circumstance that we can be in. It's in Allah's book. SubhanAllah. And it nurtures the heart. And it protects us. And it allows us to have that perfect balance between the outward and the inward, between this world and the hereafter. And looking at things from the standpoint of sharia outwardly in the same coin, but the other side is seeing everything from the standpoint of the haqiqah, from spiritualities. But this is what we learn from the Arbab at Temkin, from the great awliya and the salihin, that are means of our thabat, and are means for us to remain firm because this is how they are is that they have that ability to put everything in its proper place. And we benefit from them. We learn them from them. But this is what you and I need to do. We need to put ourselves in environments where our iman can strengthen. Why did the Sahaba say, Ta'al nu'min bila sa'a? They already believe. Mm. But they would say, let's believe in Allah for a period of time, i.e., let's have a discourse. Let's support one another, talk to one another in a way that's going to strengthen our iman. SubhanAllah. But I want to just finish because there's only a couple minutes left. I don't want to take too much of y'all's time. Is that look at the verses that come after that. That warning was from shaitan trying to prompt you to fear his followers. Mm. So do not fear them. Fear me. If you are true believers. And then look at the verses after this. O Prophet, لا يحزنك الذين يسارعون في الكفر Do not grieve for those who race to disbelieve. إنهم لن يضر الله شيئا Surely they will not harm Allah in the least. 
يريد الله أن لا يجعل لهم حظا في الآخرة. It is Allah's will to disallow them a share in the hereafter. It's their choice. They messed up. They chose the wrong thing. And there's eternal consequences. ولهم عذاب عظيم. And they will suffer a tremendous punishment. إن الذين اشتروا الكفر بالإيمان. Those who trade belief for disbelief. لن يضر الله شيئا. That they will never harm Allah in the East. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَنِيمٌ And they will suffer a painful punishment. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا أَنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ يَنْفُسِهِمْ Those who disbelieve should not think that living longer is good for them. Mm. All they have is the things of this world. إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُ إِثْمًا They're only given more time to increase in sin. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ And they will suffer a humiliating punishment. And then, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَعَالَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ And I'm going to end on this verse. Let's think about this very carefully. Allah will not leave the believers in the condition you are in until He distinguished the good from the evil among you. We don't want to be from the khabith. We want to be from the tayyib. And as the world becomes further and further and further polarized, and this is going to continue to happen to the end of time, we want to be from the fariq that is pure iman, hmm. pure faith, with zero hypocrisy in it. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلُعُكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَجْتَبِي مَنْ رُسْئِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءِ Nor would Allah directly reveal to you the unseen, but He chooses whoever He wills as a messenger. And then, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَجْتِبُ وَآمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُولِهِ So believe in Allah and His messengers. وَنْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَتَتَّقُوا And this is all we have to do. If we have belief, and in everything that is there about cultivating those meanings of belief in our heart, وَتَتَّقُوا And be mindful of Allah. Put everything in its proper place. Fulfill His commandments. Avoid His prohibitions. فَلَكُمْ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ you will receive a great reward. This is not my words or the words of anyone else. These are the words of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And if we open up our heart to these meanings, it will transform us. And that this is hopefully going to be an opportunity to revive Iman in the hearts of believers. Pure Iman, where there's zero nifaq. Mm -hmm. And Iman so powerful that it motivates us to that do whatever it is that we can do from what Allah, Allah Ta'ala has permitted to prepare for the meeting with Him and to uphold justice to the extent possible and a man that's so strong that as our Prophet prayed for that I ask you for yuqeen I ask you for a suit or two that is so great yuhawwinu alayna masaib al-dunya or masaib al-dahr the whereby which Allah Ta'ala makes easy all of the tribulations that come to us in our days and in time. And if we have the strong Iman, then anything that outwardly appears to be exceedingly difficult in reality will be good because this is the definition of khair according to the true scholars. Khair is what benefits in the hereafter, mm -hmm. even if it is bitter while we're here in this world. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq, strengthen our hearts, fortify them, make us firm upon the path, Open our hearts to the meanings of Allah's book. Open our hearts to the meanings of what our Prophet has conveyed to us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we put everything in its proper place and to be exemplars for humanity to come to what we know is the ultimate truth of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Barakallahu feekum. I'm sorry for taking so much of your time. Inshallah, I hope we will see many of you that are following this podcast in person soon. Bi'ilnillah. Inshallah, jazakallah khair. I know you have a hard stop. And we passed your heart stop. So I don't want to take any more time uh, except for a 10 second rapid fire question. Um, people who are, we said, uh, fighting in the day, but they're worshipers at night. And we can extend that to someone working in the dunya, whatever they're doing in the day. Do you have uh, a best practice in terms of when we should shut stuff off? Is it like after Maghrib when it gets dark? Like when, there's no off button anymore in today's work world. Work can travel yeah. with you to the bedroom, to the living room, the kitchen. Sure. The, the one thing I would say there is that different people have different circumstances. The most important thing is to have a schedule. Hmm. Make the priority of your day your five daily prayers. And then add to that prophetic supplications in the morning, prophetic supplications in the evening, 
and five minutes of solitude before you go to bed. SubhanAllah. And then you start adding from there other things that you can do. That's the heart of it. Make that a priority over yeah. everything. Make that the axis and the pivot of your day. And then slowly start filling in the other times that you have. And inshallah ta'ala, the doors will open. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much for coming on. And inshallah, we look forward to having you again. See you soon. Habib. See you soon. Barakallah fiqh. There you have it. Uh, the Sheikh talked about five minutes of solitude every day. It does a, it does wonders for a person, and and especially if you live in a hectic world where it's constant, nonstop movement and nonstop uh, pinging, getting pinged from your phone. Uh, it's really not good for us. This kind of living, we need something daily as a routine, and it's going to build up. Anything that you want to change. You need to make it first a very practical, doable, cannot fail at doing it, sliver of your day. The Sheikh said five minutes of sitting by yourself, no machines, no computer, put a timer on, and just contemplate exactly you know, life, contemplate our deeds with Allah, make dua, do remembrance, or just sit in silence, uh, letting your thoughts settle. Who doesn't have five minutes a day? But when it happens every single day, it has a big effect on us. Okay. So there's there are a couple of questions here that... Uh, I wanted to answer. How do you rid your heart from hypocrisy? That's an excellent question. And the answer to that is to do deeds in secret. Ultimately, hypocrisy is to worship Allah, seeking some kind of aim from the people of the world, or or some kind of praise for the people of this world, or some kind of benefit, not seeking any benefit from Allah Himself. So, in order to strengthen your relationship with Allah, deeds done alone that nobody knows—that's your secret. That is the secret of ridding the heart of hypocrisy. The other feature of hypocrites is they never tell the truth. They don't really bind themselves by the truth. And so uh, always being obsessed with the truth. But you, do, you also have to have some common sense because there are times when you're allowed to backbite and there are times you're allowed to lie. Aside from that, we should be people who are like obsessed with the truth. And the truth, by the way, is not just the truth of la ilaha illallah. This could lead us to our next segment. The truth is also... Uh, regarding what's happening between people. Omar, are we ready to go to that um, series of, of, of posts? Yeah. What does the hadith mean uh, if you change things with your hand, then with your tongue, then with your heart, and that is the weakest of faith? It means... It's the weakest situation for a Muslim. Because if you could change something in there with your hand, that means you have a legal authority to do so. Okay? That's strength. Changing something with your um, tongue means it's in between. You, you don't ha you're not powerless and you're not an authority, but you can talk. Then changing something with your heart is when you can't do anything and you can't talk. Because you could be harmed or killed or whatever. So all you have to do is hate it with your heart. Okay. And that's really the situation of a lot of Muslims today in the Western Hemisphere. When it comes to the um, things like the issue of Israel today, if you're in a certain field, a certain business, you can't talk. But it's okay if you can't talk because there's talking online and making posts is not the only way to benefit. Right? Uh, you can... Do other things. You can call your congressman in private. You can... I'm just giving that example because somebody recently did that. They, they said because of their sensitive nature of their work, they can't, they can't uh, post anything. But posting is not the only way that things could get done. Right? There's a lot of other ways that you can contribute. Hello?
go to let's go to the slides now. We ready? <sighs> All right, look at this. These are technically two different images, by the way. Um, we talked about the uh, genocidal mentality. The genocidal mentality of a lot of Israelis. Look, this is Ben Shapiro before the war. And he says here that enemy civilian casualties are okay by me, he says. Okay, so just so that we, we get the idea of how uh, a genocide doesn't happen because a country makes a policy. A genocide happens because all the people want it to happen. Enough people want it to happen. When you have a man like Shapiro who uh, has a big following, he's one of the founders of the, of the Christian-based conservative Daily Wire, uh, founded and and uh, by a Christian and a Jew, he's one of the founders. Another one's a Christian, and it was funded by the Wilkes brothers, who are like Jews for Jesus types. They're Christians; they're not Jews, but their brand of Christianity upholds the Old Testament, follows Jewish uh, holidays, believes that Jesus is a soul, is a completely different entity from God and is the son of God, but is a whole different entity from God. So that's how they justify their pure monotheism. And their church is on Saturday. So it's a sort of an admixture of Judaism and Christianity. In fact, if anything, that's probably closer to what Allah had intended. Okay. What Allah had intended was for the Bible, the Torah, to be one with the Injil, the, the, the Torah and the Bible, the Evangel, the Injil, to be one book. That was the intent. And the Zabur of Dawood, it's all one book. But uh, clearly we know that didn't happen. And then Paul, who was like a, a, he never met Jesus. He had a vision on the road to Damascus that he needs to spread Christianity he goes in there and he's the biggest innovator. He alters everything. He romanizes Christianity and starts his movement. Okay, Paul has, has a lot of issues with this man. But he's the one who separated Christianity from Judaism more than anybody else. But they were, they're these Jews for Jesus type. Although they're Christians, that's the, 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 the kind of religion that they are. Well, the Daily Wire is a massive operation. And all of their people, except for Candace Owens, have been extremely um, uh, pro-Israel, uh, cheerleading, having no sense of condemnation at all for anything Israel does. And if you say a single word, this is a little move that they have. If you utter a single word, they label you as anti-Semitic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَأَحِبَّاءُ Jews and Christians said, We are the sons of Allah and His most beloved. We are the chosen people. Okay? قُلْ فَلِمَا يُعَذِّبُكُمْ بِذُنُوبِكُمْ Then why is He punishing you by making you so sinful? And they are sinful. They upset their prophets. They anger their messengers. Okay? They alter their books. They play tricks with the law. And now they're oppressing people. This is sort of sort of punishment. But antum basharum mimman khalaq. Ya Yahud, ya Nasara. You're just a group of people that Allah created. You don't have any special status. This is the big issue that of the entitlement that you feel that because I'm fact checking Israel, because I'm disagreeing with them, and hold on, am I gonna get called an anti Semite? To heck if fact-checking and criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic, then half the, 90% of, 5% of the world is anti-Semitic. We can't continue allowing this game to be peddled that you cannot talk or else we label you. The label is starting to mean nothing. right? And I think we, we went across this with racism. The other day I was walking and I saw, uh, I heard some youth sort of laughing at the label. Because it's been so overused. Like everything to shut somebody up, race card. 
Oh, you're racist. This is racism. This is uh, microaggression, subtle racism, right? Excuse me. It's gone, been so overdone, it's becoming meaningless. And an anti-Semite is the exact same way. Nobody is criticizing Israel for the sake of their being Jews. They're being criticized for the sake of their actions. And that's a whole bunch of slides I want to share with that, right? Uh, uh, I'm gonna, let's go to the next slide. Can you expand it slightly? I don't know if you can, if everyone can read that. Um All right, here we have Keith Wood says, Times of Israel co-owner Seth Klarman donates millions to the ADL to help them fight anti-Semitism. While his publication explains that an anti-Semitic or anti-Semitism actually means seeing Jews as equals. All right, to dislike certain ethnicities is racist. To see Jews as equals is anti-Semitic. No, uh, well then, count me in then. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ بَشَرٌ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقٍ You are just people like everybody else. Standards apply to you. You can imagine all you want that you're the chosen people. You can imagine all you want that you could do whatever you want to other people. Okay? And get away with it. But you cannot expect everyone else to live by that. No. According to me, you are people just like anybody else. And that's how we have to go. Next one. So these are all people who have been very active on Twitter, which is, again, probably one of the only platforms that allows for this kind of discussion. All right, here we have Jake Shields, a fighter, a former MMA fighter. The majority of Muslims were starting to vote Republican. That's true. You remember from June until October, Muslims, the ice between Muslims and Republicans really melted away quick. But this conflict reminds them of what Republicans actually think about them. Okay. And Samira Khan says, leftists hate us for being anti-LGBT. Rightists hate, hate us for being pro-Palestine. Once again, we are politically homeless. And she's right about that. We are completely politically homeless. Okay. Next one. All right. Jackson Hinkle has come out of the woodwork to be an amazing voice on what's happening. And this is the event. We actually have babies. Here they are. This is what it looks like when babies are killed. Yeah. We see people here, human beings. This is what it looks like when babies are killed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for the, for a reason. For people to see, this is what happens when your babies are actually killed. You have a photo. And, we're, and someone could say, well, who knows what this photo is? Don't worry. We have a video coming next with the context. Meaning people talking about events today with these babies in front of them. So no one says it's just an image from somewhere else. Could it's... It could be from some other earthquake, right? But no, we have the footage here. All right, let's play this one. All right, this one's just a picture. Here we have Jace Jackson Hick, uh, Hinkle. Again, it's a good um, page to follow. He says, Israel could not hide the truth of their war crimes. They are targeting children. So you have a little girl completely bloodied. Next one. Again, Jackson Hinkle is like a machine these days. He is just all over the place posting anti-Zionism, anti-Zionist and pro-Palestinian talk. Seven-day-old pa Palestinian baby, Nabila Nofal, was killed in an Israeli airstrike. Okay, seven months. She got to live on this earth for seven months. Huh? Seven days. seven days. Subhanallah. Seven days. All right. So what about any comments from Pierce Morgan, Ben Shapiro now? But no, no comment at all on this. Probably his, the, her parent, her dad must have done it. That's why. Her dad must have killed her. Took advantage of the war and say, okay, we could blame Israel. Let's kill our kids. 
Next one. And here you have an image, direct image of the rubble. Okay. This killed 10 people and 7 children. Look at that building. I mean, where is this rubble going, by the way? Is, is there like a rubble, a rubble cleanup at the end of every war? Is there a company that gets hired to clean up the mess? No, they're going to live in this mess for years to come. The, the building is going to stay that way for years to come because they don't have the resources to go rebuilding everything. Next one. And here you have massive protests in Greece for the people of Gaza. There were massive protests in Spain. Spain is supposed to hate Muslims. There are massive protests in Jordan. Okay. So these numbers, the mainstream media is disgusting. They keep parroting the concern for the victims, concern for the for the Israelis. Nothing ever, complete radio silence on the Palestinians. They're completely bought and sold. That's why a guy like this is doing great work because he's exposing the other side. You can't, there's a new media now. Everyone can be in the media as long as you have one of these. You're going to take footage of a story that's happening in front of you and it's yours, okay? You broke the story. So they're just, they're, there's nothing special about CBS. They, they get orders like everybody else. They just get orders what to say and what not to say. And when they're a bit more sophisticated, they um, they get the message that this is what the boss is like. This is what he doesn't like. Get the message. You can stay in between, but you can't go to what he doesn't like. Next, next one. All right. So, what was a lie? Jackson Hinkle again. Beheading babies. Hamas raping women. Israelis kids in cages. Tried to burn. Tried. Uh, they lied to you about the, the hospital bombing. What will they lie about next? So we had the 40 babies hoax, the 250 person concert hoax, and now we got the hospital hoax. Okay. Next one. So these two are supposed to be together. Shapiro says, watching the news, uh, watching the news since October 7th is like watching all of Jew-hating history condensed in 12 days. Holocaust level program. Pogrom. Holocaust denial. Blood libel. Assertions. Huh? Assurance by all the right people that the Jews ought not to deter defend themselves. Well, you're going to play this game again. How are you defending yourself when you're the aggressor? You are the aggressor in this country. Okay. This was not done peacefully like the way Theodore Herzl wanted it to be done. It's, it was done with a lot of oppression. All right. Let's go down and see how Daniel Hakikachu responds. He said, no, Ben. This is a great response. What you have been seeing is people, regular people, using the little bit of freedom they have on social media to discuss facts and evidence with logic in a manner not permitted by the Zionist-controlled media. Stop crying about it with your emotional uh, victimhood and identity politics. Facts don't care about your feelings. He's right. Um, you look at Ben Shapiro before this, and he is a gangster when it comes to talking about LGBT and woke and the woke agenda. But as soon as this happened, he's become a snowflake. The same thing that he's been criticizing. Okay. And that is that's the tweet again. Next, yeah, we're about the videos. Yep. All right, we got some videos for you. Yep. 
Let's take a comment from the floor while we get this. Who is Jackson Hinkle? It's a good question. He is somebody that I researched him once before, but I can't remember what it said about him. But he's he's not in politics. Jackson Hinkle is a conservative. Um, yeah. He's a political streamer who more on the conservative pro-Russian side and anti-Ukraine uh, and Israel. Okay. He doesn't have a Wikipedia page yet, which is interesting. But he is all over social media. Every day, 10 posts, 12 posts. He's responding to uh, Shapiro and everything. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts on Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's letter? No, I didn't see it. Where is it? Where is it? Where can I find it? Tahir Ramazan. Where can I find his letter? I mean, it's it's nine. It's 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 uh, October nineteenth, right? It's seventeen days later, and now a letter was sent out. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be great, but. Uh, 19 days later All right, sorry uh, uh, 12 days later Harun Mateen says the most painful is obvious we all talk condemn the oppressor we're all heartbroken but the aggressor will do what they want They'll do what they do good. They're good at, and then we will return to Halloween. Meaning, at the end of the month, America has a, hol- uh, a holiday they call Halloween. I don't know if it exists in England or not, but, but yeah, that's the frustration. But that's also part of our punishment collectively as an Ummah. You haven't been given the ability because you didn't fight when you were supposed to. Now, when you have to, right? You don't have the tawfiq. All right, let's go to these videos. Yeah, go ahead. All right, you see this? Again, shooting children. The the genocidal approach. It doesn't just happen by itself. All right, it happens because... Here now they're doing it. Nobody's saying anything. How we have footage right here. How is this not something that CNN is going to show? Right? They'll never show this stuff. They're complete mouthpieces for the state of Israel. Next one. Here, this is what we call context. A video cannot be denied. That's what I'm talking about. When you see a picture, you need some context to know it's real. All right? This one shows us. All right, next one. Again, another civilian, not a soldier at all. And they shot him in the head, it looks like. And he's saying, where are all the Arab countries? Um, 
سبحان الله سبحان الله All right, that'll never what have that'll never make it. I chal- I would challenge someone from CNN to ever put this on. Next one. Look at this old man, and boom, they just pushed him down like that. An old man who hit his head and is now not moving. We don't know the latest, but he went down. He hit his head, and now he's not moving. All right, this is what is he Hamas? Is he regular Palestinian? Okay. Next one. Now I know what they do because I used to ask them to do it. All right. Pause real quick. When I was in the Mossad and we had. All right. This is a former Mossad agent. He's telling you. He's going to show you how they would monitor every journalist, and then eventually, if a journalist speaks, says that Israel is doing something wrong, they go up. They they work the phones. They get to their bosses and they say, this guy needs to be labeled. Put the anti-Semitic sticker on him. He says, because it's so hard to get it off you. It's one of those labels that society has deemed it so bad that um, there's almost no repentance from it in our society. All right, let's hear what he has to say. A guy that gave us problems in the U.S. and he was speaking out and he was talking like, like people talked once and said, Israel is bombing Lebanon with buster bombs. We say, hey, who's that guy? You know? So he's not denying it. We used to call him. Yeah. Which is Pete the Cockroach. Because he makes a lot of noise and you can't get rid of him. So what you do is you get in touch with a guy in, in, the, in the station in New York or in the station in Washington. You say, tell the guys at B'nai B'rith to label them. And, of course, the campaign starts, and before you know it, the guy's leaving. And he's an anti semite because that's what we say he is. And that's one stain you cannot wash. Now, it shames me as a Jew to tell you that. But that's the fact, and it's wrong. Okay, next. So th- that's it. That's your little... Um Traverse of Twitter accounts that are tweeting good things. Censored Man, Jake Shields, Anastasia, and I don't follow her that much. And Jackson Hinkle. They've been doing a great work. I also quoted you Propaganda and Co. All right, Propaganda and Co. are there too. They're one of the best. And uh, they've been responding to everybody too. And that's what we. that's all we can do is just keep responding to people. And trying to get them, get as many people to see the truth as possible. The truth is not just Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That's not the only thing when we say fight for the truth. It also means truth regarding injustice happening here. About wrong things happening. That's what we have to be talking about. Can we have a stream just dedicated to dhikr of Hasbi Allah and Amin Waqeed? Yes, inshallah, one, we could possibly do that. Nothing wrong with that. We're going to have a short stream today because we have a very busy afternoon. So let's take a few questions now. Yeah. Uh, you can't commit war crimes and then shut everybody up by pouring some uh, anti-Semitism sauce all over your war crimes. And we all have to uh, just shut their, shut our mouths because we're afraid to be called an anti-Semite. You know the boy who, who cried wolf? Okay. That's exactly what, what it is now. The boy who cried wolf. It's one thing to actually pinpoint people like the Nazis, as anti-Semites. It's another thing when you're a country now. You're going to have conflict. You're going to have supporters and detractors. You're not special. You will have supporters and detractors. So to just anyone who utters a word against our policy or military action, 
that's what the the crime here. Your policies and your military actions. No, we're going to call them an anti-Semite. It's not working anymore. Right? It's not working. If criticizing their your political policies and your actions is anti-Semitic, we're all call us all anti-Semitic. Anyway, you're not even you're not even the Semites in the region. You're Eastern European Ashkenazis, right? The Semites in the region in the region are those who have been living there from the time of Prophet Abraham. That's what Semitic means. From the sons of Sham ibn Nuh. How are we on our uh, campaign for Gaza? All right, great. We hit eleven thousand eighty-seven dollars by pounds. By the end of the stream, we'll hit it at eleven thousand one hundred pounds. So, oh, we're only thirteen away, thirteen British pounds away from one thousand. From what is it? Eleven thousand? Huh? Eleven thousand one hundred pounds. All right. The and the conversion is thirteen thousand four hundred and ninety-six. Um. Yeah. Dollars. So that's what we raised so far. Thirteen thousand four hundred ninety-six dollars. Can you talk about how Salah Hadin united the the Hambaris and the non the Ashadis and the Hambaris? Really? Okay. Yes, it's true. But it was it a campaign. It was a campaign they all had in common. That's why it was true. They were facing the enemy. When you're facing the enemy directly, right, it uh, makes no sense to discuss th the differences between the two of you. Yep. And they were in his army. They had different jobs advising the student, uh, the, the military, giving them talks, teaching them. Yeah, yesterday we talked about those medkhalis who are blaming the Palestinians because they have shirk and that that's why they're getting bombed. These munafiks are now criticizing the Palestinians in this hour and criticizing the supporters of Palestinians in this time, not uttering a word against what happened to the people of Gaza. They didn't utter a single word. They didn't get involved in rectifying misinformation. No. They're maybe puppets of some other government. That's what they are. They're puppets of another government out there. We're not going to say who they are on the air. What is our opinion about the Jordanian royal family who betrayed the Ummah during wars, even though they are said from Ahlul Bayt? Okay. Well, you can be a say it all you want. And we support you and love you until you do something wrong. Then our love for you is to stop you. That's our love for the for the edited bait is to stop them, to treat them with some respect, maybe not to smear their name. Okay, but we can talk to them. We can assert that something's wrong, and we can fix it, and we can talk to them. Yes, Al Qadi had blasted the Madkhalis in a video yesterday. Interesting. I want to see that. I, I want to also see Abdul Hakim Murad's letter. Um, when and where is this? Where is it posted? Yeah. All right. We'll have to look it up. And find we'll find it another time. For now, we we're having a short stream today. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up right now. It's probably one of the shortest streams we've done, but we had to to shorten it this time. Okay. All right, my brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu fikum, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik wal asr. إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. No, there's no class tonight because we have an event. We have a Palestine event at the masjid, so there's no class. <laughs>